Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. We have our speaker who we have first have a brief announcements period, then our speaker speaks, and we have an extensive question and answer period where we ask that you have a question, and at the end of that question period we have our infamous rebuttal period, and our speaker then gets the last word. Tonight we have Bart Goldberg, candidate for the Illinois Senate State Senator for the 20th District. He says, I'll fight for progressive values and taking big money out of politics. His positions are, take big money out of politics, offer all children a great education, solve our state budget crisis, protect our environment, fix our criminal justice system, enact common sense gun laws, and raise the minimum wage to $14 an hour. <coughs> Rounding round of applause for our speaker, Mr. Bart. Bart. Bird, yes. Come on up and let's get to let's get this show. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings, friends. Well, it's a pleasure to be here in front of a group of people who avow that they like to think. I hope you're not embarrassed about that in this day and age. Uh, Many of you probably know that when uh, Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, there was another speaker that was the featured speaker that day, uh, a, a guy by the name of Edward Everett. And he was the uh, preeminent orator of his day, and he spoke for two and a half hours at Gettysburg. I want to assure you I've never gone to the Edward Everett School of Speechifying and that uh, while I won't speak as eloquently as him, I will speak much more quickly. So I'm Bart Gold thank you. So I'm Bart Goldberg and I am running for state senate in the state of Illinois where nothing changes. We keep electing the same people, making the same mistakes and we're almost past the breaking point. I am disgusted, and I will go into it in some depth here in a minute, but uh, first I wanted to talk a little bit about how difficult it is, uh, you know, that to run against an incumbent in this state. You know, why is it I say that uh, we keep electing uh, the same people? To give you a few statistics, there's 39 state senators that are up for election this year, out of 59, it was, and it's irrelevant why that happens, but there's 39. Out of the 39, except for the ones running against the gentleman that has a sex scandal, that's Ira Silverstein, outside of that election, <coughs> I am the only one out of 39 that even challenges an incumbent in this state. Why is that? that? I mean, why is it that rare? You, you might say, Bart, quit your whining. You know, the, the, the other people in, in the Senate, they, they had to win their first election. And I would say to you, unfortunately, you're wrong. Would you believe that nearly half of the current Senate first became a senator by appointment? Just like, uh, well, for every senator, there's two representatives. The representative in my district, one of them, Jamie Andrade. He didn't win his first election. Somebody else, sort of like what uh, uh, Gutierrez did recently, resigning. Somebody resigns, the party guys meet in a smoke-filled room, maybe at the Dapper's East, I don't know. But the party guys meet, they select the next person, they become the new senator, and then uh, a year later, they run with all of the awesome powers of incumbency behind them. It is a sick system. And most of the rest of them that weren't appointed, they ran because there was an open seat. I didn't even know the statistic I'm about to give you when I first decided to run. In the last 10 years, we've elected nearly 200 state senators in Illinois. And only twice, 
twice has someone done what I'm trying to do right now, which is to unseat an incumbent in a primary. I told that to my wife recently, and she, she said, you know, that's something maybe you should have told me before I, uh, I agreed to let you run. Uh, she's right, but uh, this way I got to run, so it's not all bad. So, so it's terribly difficult. We have this state where things, things are so stratified. I mean, we, 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 we elect the same people over and over, and of course a big part of it is what we call the democratic machine. And it's existed here for many, many, you know, a hundred years or more. And it may not be as powerful as it once was, but believe me, it's a force to reckon with. And later, if people are interested, I'd be glad to talk about all the ways that the system here in Illinois is set up to make it really difficult for anyone to challenge uh, an incumbent. Well, back to why I'm running. I, I'm a progressive Democrat. So what do I mean by that? By that I mean, you know, I, I, I believe in things you would expect me to believe in. I, I, I believe profoundly that we have a duty to help those in society that are less fortunate than us. I believe that we've got an absolute duty to educate all children, particularly the ones that are less fortunate, that are, that, that are even poor. I'm a, a big believer in the benefits of sensible regulation. Businesses have to be regulated. You can't let them run rough, roughshod on the, uh, on the rest of us. We, we, we've, got, uh, we've got to do that. Uh, but while I agree with progressives, and I consider myself to be a progressive Democrat, in many, many regards, there's two ways that I'm fundamentally different. And that's what I want to talk about. The first is that I want to aggressively attack our unfunded pension debt. Now that may not excite some people, but hopefully by the time I'm finished talking you'll agree that it's, it's of paramount importance. What am I talking about? Back in the 1990s, little history here, uh, we owed about 15 billion dollars to the workers of this state. That was considered to be a large sum. So the, uh, both parties were very concerned about this and they came up with an absolutely brilliant, and if you don't hear the sarcasm in my voice, brilliant plan to try and address this. And it was called the Edgar Ramp. It was named after the governor at the time who proposed it, James Edgar. But don't blame just the Republicans because there was a Democratic Congress. They were all for it as well. And what it did was it said, okay, we need to make the pension solvent. You know, just like if a business has a pension system, right? They always put money aside to fund it, and it always has to be 90% funded. So they said, yeah, we need to make our pension system solvent as well, but let's do it over a 50-year path. What a plan. So they created something called the Edgar Ramp, and what it did You'll see my hand here. It, 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 it called for sort of even payments over about 10, 12 years, and then slowly ramped up to really high payments 50 years later. Okay? 50, 50 50, 5-0. Now, this was an incredibly foolish plan for many reasons, but it's become even more foolish in the interim sense. For one thing, over the first 10 to 12 years, the amount that was being funded under the Edgar Ramp was less than what the payout was every year to the pensions. So it was intentionally negative amortizing. In other words, over that time period, they knew good and well that the debt was not going to get smaller, it was going to get bigger, and it did. Then we had a couple of years under uh, Governor Blagojevich uh, where he took what are called pension holidays. Well, that sounds festive, but all it means is that he made no payments at all during those years into the pension funds. So that ramp became even steeper. But the killer was that there was this insane assumption built into it that our pension funds would accrue, they would grow at 8.5%. 
Well, not only has that not happened, but we had many years of recession where it went down. So what are we left with? Well, the, the, the state, their own department claims that we owe about $140 billion to our workers right now. Moody's, who puts us just above junk bond status, says it's 250,000, 250 million, I'm sorry, thank you. Billion. Billion. Again, I started with thousand, billion, it's billion for sure. That comes to, for every working person, $40,000. I owe it. You owe it. If you see a worker on the street tomorrow, give them the $40,000 and then you two are clean, okay? It is a huge problem. But how does it affect us now? Well, under the Edgar Ramp, Last year we had to pay $9 billion towards the pensions. That's about five times more than a normal state pays because of the fact that these politicians acted like children for 40 years by not funding this pension plan. $9 billion is a quarter of our budget. That's extreme. But under this Edgar Ramp, within 10 years, it's going to double. So if income doesn't go up, essentially 50% of our state's revenue within 10 years is going to be going only to pensions. Again, I want to make it really clear, don't be mad at these workers. It's not their fault that the government failed to fund this. But that's, the, that, that's what's happened. So what can we do about it? Well, what I want to do is aggressively pay it down. Uh, I, I think we have to. Uh, you know, it, it, it's like a high interest credit card that's just killing us. I mean, when 50% when of your revenue is going just to pensions, how do you take care of everything that humane government is supposed to do? How do we educate our children? You know, provide social services for the needy, the elderly, the mentally ill, the disabled, take care of the environment, take care of infrastructure. We can't. And that's why businesses right now are scared to death to come here. They don't know how we're going to handle this tax Armageddon that's about to hit. And it's why people are leaving. I call it intergenerational theft. The politicians of the last 40 years have stolen from us, and they've stolen from our children. So we've got to fix it. We've got to be the adults in the room. And what I'm telling you, is that neither party has shown any appetite to do it. Of course, Governor Rauner's not doing it. But on my beloved Democratic side, Madigan and Cullerton, they act like it doesn't exist either. Their, their concern, in my humble view, is each year to kick the can down the road, do just enough, bring in the campaign money from their wealthy uh, lobbyists so that they can re-elect the club. Make sure the club is re-elected. And don't look beyond that next election two years from now. And it's just got to stop. We've got to take a long-range view. So what I want to do, as I said, is I want to aggressively pay down that debt. How can we do it? Obviously, we would love to have the progressive income tax. I want to tax those making over 500000 an extra 2%, over a million, 3%. Obviously, this is going to be difficult because it requires a constitutional amendment. But the people of Illinois are overwhelmingly in favor of it. The problem is getting it out of Springfield, where these lobbyists are going to uh, raise all sorts of heck trying to keep it from happening. But there is a critical mass. While maybe 90% of our legislators right now do little except vote yes on what Madigan and Cullors have put in front of them, there are some thinking people that, that, that are aware of this and are, and are willing to take that stand, that next step, and that's what we've got to do. Another thing I want to do to address it is I want to tax pensions. Uh, some people don't like that, but believe it or not, Illinois is one of only five states in the United States that don't tax pensions. I want to set the floor on that high, $75,000. That way, if someone has a moderate or small pension below $75,000 a year, they wouldn't pay any tax. They've planned on that, and I, I think that's fair. 
But there are people getting pensions of 225, 250,000. They can pay a little bit of income tax. Now, if we do those two things that I just mentioned, just those two, we could raise about three to four billion dollars a year. Now, that may not sound large compared to a 200 billion dollar debt, but if we make the payment we're supposed to, plus that three or four billion a year, it'll do a lot to smooth down that Edgar Ramp. And if we can smooth down that Edgar Ramp, then businesses maybe won't be afraid to come here. They'll see we got a plan. They'll come back again. And if we can get businesses to come back, then the tax base widens, and then maybe taxes could go down for everyone. But most importantly, well, there's two things just as important. One is we would continue to have humane government, not just the government we have now, but even more humane, like a real progressive would want. And two, we would not have stolen the, the future from our children. So to me, it's just absolutely critical that we do this. And, and that's why I say that's issue number one for me. The second is the reason that I think we are in this mess to begin with, and that has to do with the evils of campaign contributions. We all know that when companies or any entity give large contributions to candidates, it's not charity. It's pay to play. It's make money, invest money to make money. And Illinois seems to be particularly susceptible to this. One of my favorite books on Illinois politics opens with the sentence saying, Illinois since its inception has had a citizenry that for some reason feels the government is just another business. You invest money to make money. It is so wrong. But because of that, we are just primed for the abuses that campaign contributions create. Well, I've been working for campaign finance reform for some time, and we are nowhere near it. If you go to my website, you'll see I have some real ideas about what we could do in Springfield about it, but I'm not naive enough to think it'll happen. The members of the club, the ones that are already there, don't have any interest in campaign finance reform. It's why, it's why they've been elected. They want it to be difficult to be removed from office. So I don't think it's going to happen. So what do I do, considering that I think I'm a moral guy? I set standards that are higher than that for my own campaign. I won't take one dollar from an entity of any type, not a company, a corporation, a trade union, a PAC, a union of any type, not even the Red Cross. Only people and only small, and by that, Excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Just a second. Gary, can I take a sneeze time out here? No, I don't have to. <laughs> By that, I mean less than $1,000. That way, no one can think I have a conflict of interest. I have no obligation except to the people of the 20th and my own conscience. And I think that as voters, we need to start insisting that our candidates do that, that they take such a vow. If we could do that, then we don't need campaign finance reform. We as voters can do it. And if we could do that, then, uh, you know, before long we might have honest government in Illinois. And, and that wouldn't be a, all bad, right? What are, you, what are you just saying we should do as voters? I'm suggesting that you should demand that your candidates not take campaign contributions from entities, particularly the big ones. I mean, my opponent last week well, it's been two weeks now, I keep saying that, and time marches on. Two weeks ago, she took a campaign contribution of $50,000 from a PAC. And, and it's, you know, that's not high. I mean, it, you know, when, when you run against the machine, they have untold money. Last time, no one's challenged her for 10 years. Last time someone did, the Democratic Senate Victory Fund, a group that exists just to make sure that the club is always reelected, wrote her a check for $500,000. That's back when that was real money. So they do it. So if we ever want honest government, 
I think we have to insist that our candidates take such pledges, and uh, that's what I'm doing. And uh, uh, you know, hopefully, it'll catch on. But but uh, you know, as I said, due to the difficulties of challenging an incumbent, it is difficult. Now, again, as a progressive. There's a lot of other issues near and dear to my heart. If you go to my website, and I would encourage you to, it's really detailed. I call myself a public policy nerd. By the way, my background, uh, uh, I went to college and law school at the University of Chicago. I, I have, uh, my college degree was in economics, and then in law school I studied uh, law and economics. And even since then, I have taken countless courses on public policy, philosophy, religion, science. You know, I, I, like you guys, I, I like to read. So I call myself a public policy nerd. And I want to make this a, a full-time job. Most of our legislators don't. They're there for various reasons. Some are there for ego. Some are there because it leads them to you know, quite sizable incomes outside of politics. So many of them have tax appeal businesses or they're consultants. My opponent's a consultant. By the way, I didn't mean to not say her name. Her name is Iris Martinez, if you should know her. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I plan on instead making this, I, I'm, I'm a lawyer, a mom and pop practice, but I've done okay. And my wife does real well. And this is my way to give back because I could do other things to give back, but there's no way that I could help more people than doing this because this is just my skill set. You know, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a nerd and uh, I, I've, I've got a lot of ideas in this regard, so I'd love a, a, you know, a chance to do it. But uh, uh, so, you know, as a result, my, my website's considerably more detailed than most of you will see. Uh, a lot of you ever go to political websites, some of them just say, well, I love the, I love the environment. Boy, those school teachers sure are great. And, uh, you know, they, they don't deal with any problem at all. But, but I do, and I take stances that are unpopular at times, although you, I'm learning the hard way. You've got to avoid that as much as you, as much as you can because uh, oh, so many people, I'm s sorry to say in my view, are really one-issue voters. You know, the, the, the one thing that's important to them, the rest of them be darned. And, 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 and I just think that's unfortunate because, as I said, this problem with the debt is going to lead to us not having humane government. And, and, and as a result, it's like we're on the Titanic, and it's the iceberg right in front of us. And people that worry about a lot of the smaller things. Well, if you you know, I know we can do two things at once, and I'm all for that. But it's it's this first thing that just has to be job one, or we really aren't going to have a future. And by the way, some people think, well, that's all right. We'll declare bankruptcy someday, or 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 or, or we'll change it so that these pensions don't have to be paid. Well, one, not only is that immoral, they did the work. We have to pay them. But the Constitution requires it. A few years ago. They tried to pass a very misguided bill that was going to change some of the terms of the pensions for people currently receiving pensions. And the Supreme Court said, no way. The Supreme Court said, you know, we've got this Constitution that says a pension benefit is a contract that can never be diminished. Now, in my view, that's kind of nuts. Why can it be increased but not diminished? But that is our Constitution, and we're stuck with that Constitution. And interestingly, the reason that was put in our Constitution then was that at that very time the politicians in Springfield knew that they were going to have problems, you know, forcing themselves to make those pension contributions because it's never popular. You know, saving is never sexy. I mean, what's, what, what, what attracts voters is, is showing them the the shiny new thing that you built on the uh, on the corner. So, to me, th that's got to be the biggest thing. But there are many other issues that I'm passionate about. Gun control, huge issue. I'd be glad to talk about it if anybody has uh, uh, questions. Uh, the environment, boy, I'm more than a little concerned about that. Uh, 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 
I, I don't know what else to tell you, so uh, I'll be glad to take questions. What I uh, All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who selects the questioners? Do you do it? We usually have like a moderator, but if nobody's up there, go ahead and... Um, You'll be the moderator. All right. I'll be the moderator. Nice to meet you, moderator. Oh, right. All right. Dan. Who has a question? Can I ask very quick? The lady in uh, black and white. No, uh, uh, my wife. See, I don't want a camera. I know. Listen, very quick, if I may. Can you vote, please, for the three uh, city colleges education? For three, because Ram Emanuel, who was mentioned, about What's like a question? Could you can you vote, vote for the free for college the, education? You elected, can you vote for uh, the free uh, city uh, college education? Well, could you repeat the question? What she's asking is, would I support free city college yeah. education? Yeah. And I'm all for it. But I don't know that I could vote for it today. It's very expensive, and, and, and that, that goes against what I'm saying, that we've got to deal with this problem. Now, we, there's a lot of things we can cut out of the budget, uh, and, and, and if we can do enough of that, then we can afford things that we really want like that. Wouldn't it be awesome? And, and in fact, I have uh, one idea that I think is kind of interesting. Uh, because again, it's one I, I made up myself, and I always like my own ideas best. But uh, uh, you know, you know, I, I've thought, of, and it sort of plays on. Uh, uh, if you know the economist Richard Thaler, who's he's, he's some, he got the Nobel Prize recently, and part of what you know they found is that people react better. You get a better result if you give people something and then threaten to take it away, versus giving them a carrot in the future. So I had an idea, uh, because one of the real problems that we have in our state education system is declining enrollment and, uh, and, and frankly the quality of the education in some of the schools. Uh, and there I think we need to specialize more. Uh, but my idea was why not provide that every high school student be given a fund. You start it with say $2,000 and the way it would work is that for every good grade that they got that fund would go up. For every poor grade that they got that fund would go down. And then the idea would be they could then when they graduate use those funds at a state school, like a community college, like you said. Like scholarships or like scholarships. Exactly. So that would really encourage people to go to state schools. It would help bring them in enrollment. And, uh, uh, you know, if they didn't want to go to a state school, they'd be entitled to get some of that fund, but it would be a discounted amount. And if they decided that they just uh, didn't want uh, to go to school at all. They'd get an even further discounted amount. But this would really encourage people right. to graduate yeah. and hopefully encourage them to go to these schools. And then the, uh, uh, the schools would then only be reimbursed for half of the amount of that. You know, the advantage is this doesn't take anything out of the state's pocket in advance. And then when they went to that school, the uh, school could ask for reimbursement for half that amount. So th that was an idea I had. Well, can, can we trust the state legislature to fix this pension problem? Because they voted this big pension because they know they're going to retire and get that big pension. Plus, they made 3% every year compound interest, and it balloons. It balloons, and the Supreme Court cases it said you can't change it. What can you do to, to fix it? Well, those are a lot of good questions, and I'm going to forget them all. So let's start. What was the first one? <clears throat> How are you going to fix this budget? This over. Oh. Well, we cannot change the current pension deal. That's what we were. That's what I was talking about earlier. We tried to do it three or four years ago when they passed a law. It's called SB one that anybody who had any sense knew was unconstitutional. And one of the things it tried to do was change the COLA for people that were receiving a pension. 
and the Supreme Court said no. So we can't change it. Yes, we can change it for new hires, and we've got to. Part of the problem, you know, how, how did we get in this mess to begin with? Because, frankly, while I've said they deserve every penny because we made a deal, and they worked hard and, and they're entitled to it, but frankly, they got too good a deal. And why is that? It gets back to my issue number two. Uh, when you've got unions for the state employees bargaining with the very people that they've just given hundreds of thousands of dollars to, they're sitting on both sides of the table. And it's us, the rest of the people in Illinois, that get the short end of the stick. So one thing I want to do is provide that, because these contracts are approved by the governor. And, and then uh, what I want to provide, I would like to see a law that provided that these contracts also have to be passed by the legislature. And uh, then, you know, there, there'd be more, uh, more light of day thrown onto it because we've got to change it. Now, under the old pension system, it was called Tier 1, and, and you were talking about that COLA. Yes, 3%. Uh, so come hell or high water, they get an additional 3%. When you compare that to Social Security in the last five years, there was only one year where Social Security hit 3%. The other years it was more like 1%, so they've done much better. But in fairness to them, back when things were really good, there were years when that 3% was less than Social Security went up. But the real point is this. The problem with the COLA, uh, of whatever it is, is we got to get out of the business of guaranteeing payments. That's called a defined benefit plan instead of a defined contribution plan. We need to move them to something analogous to a 401k. That way, they can invest their money as they see fit, and they take the risk of whether the market goes up or down. We're not stuck. Plus, it gives them the advantage of portability. They can then take their, their, their pension savings to another job if they should uh, so choose to. So we need to, do, we need to bargain better in the future, and uh, we, we need to move to uh, a 401k plan we recently, just this last year, passed something called Tier 3 for new hires, and it is a step in the right direction, but the defined uh, uh, contribution plan part is just voluntary, not mandatory. We've got to move to mandatory. Tim, did you have a question? Um, I'll, I'll come back later. Just go ahead and get the next question. Your ice cream's too good, right? Yeah. Well, I... It's you got the other people going. We'll get mine later. Um, uh, I'm a full-time anti-nuclear activist, and uh, Illinois is the most nuclear state in the union uh, as far as having reactors, uh, and it's also got more waste, high-level nuclear waste than any other state in the union. And um, recently, I, by that I mean ten years ago. The uh, nuclear power plant in Zion closed, and Zion, the city, lost 45% of its tax base when the nuclear plant left. And that means that the schools are, um, and the and the police and the fire, they're all thrown under the bus because they don't have money now to support the important uh, social services that every city needs to have. You bet. And so. Um, uh, recent, even more recently, uh, Brad Schneider introduced a bill uh, for just transitions for not just nuclear cities, but coal cities and coal mining cities, <coughs> such that corporations that are supporting a population or a community and the community itself are forced to, to um, to establish a fund so that the people who live in that city will not be devastated when the uh, when the plants close or when the corporations move What's out, the which they What's inevitably the do. Okay, so uh, my question is: um, this is a very very wordy question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we noticed. Where are you go, ready? Yeah, but I didn't ask the question yet. Even the question is wordy. Um, well. Okay, Make so sure. uh, could you actively support and implement 
a just transitions legislative package prior to facility closures that will protect essential public services and help with the economic transition for communities impacted by expected, in fact, inevitable closures of nuclear and coal plants and all kinds of other things. And uh, you can see what happened to Detroit when the, when the auto industry did. Okay, that, and then the, uh, what would you do to curtail Exelon's political influence and stranglehold on Illinois energy policy? <laughs> Okay. Repeat uh, the question, please. Well, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are a funny man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, no. I, I, I think. Did everyone hear the question? Against well, the death. I, I think. I think he was just joking. I, I, I think everyone heard the question, right? No, no, I didn't. Hear the well, well, I, 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 <coughs> well, first of all, she was talking about that she is against the against nuclear power and, and and that Illinois is a huge we know all that. user we of nuclear power and it's and it's true 53 percent of our energy comes from nuclear power which is far and away the largest component of you know the largest share of nuclear of, of, of any state in the country and unlike her I'm not a strong anti-nuclear power person, but I want to move wholeheartedly to wind, solar. We've we've got to move to, to environmentally free and environmentally uh, uh, safe alternatives. And and she also mentioned that a big problem with the nuclear situation is the waste. You know, oh, that that concerns. That concerns me greatly. I, I've been reading about that some of the waste sites are, 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 are just not up to snuff. And correct me if I'm wrong, though, it isn't part of the problem that we were hoping that there was going to be this sort of nuclear dump opened in Nevada, and it was going to be underneath a mountain. Yeah, yucca and, and the Yucca plant? Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yucca mountain. Yeah, Yucca Mountain. I, uh, so. I, I got to hope that there's going to be something like that soon, to, 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 because we, we the, the, that nuclear waste is just incredibly dangerous, and, and there's no no way it should be sitting around in the vicinity of people. So she then asked me, would I support legislation that would provide benefits to areas where either due to the closing of a nuclear or a coal-powered plant. People are hurting. I mean, when, when these close, we lose a lot of tax revenue, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, education isn't funded uh, uh, to the same extent, and so on. Well, first of all, about that last point, I'm a big proponent of, of trying to move education funding almost entirely to the state. So we shouldn't have that concern if we could ever do that. That's the only right way to do it. It's just, it's just criminal that for all these years, uh, uh, poor areas, and I include our inner cities, but I really include downstate Illinois. These people were getting, uh, you know, educations that they cost 25 percent of what's spent in Barrington. That, that that's just wrong. So I, I would like to see the state spend, pay a higher percentage of our education costs, and then what you said would not be as much of a problem. But certainly, it's still a problem. And yes, I would support it. But it gets back to the same issue with her. I mean, we've got to be realistic about how broke we are. We are broke. And when you let politicians spend money on things now, in 10 years, I, I mean, we're almost not going to have a state government. The wealthy are leaving. Businesses are gone. Bankruptcy is not an option. I meant to mention that earlier. Not only is it constitutionally required to pay it, a state cannot declare bankruptcy. Only a city can. This state's very existence as a humane government is at stake. And so the interim may be a little bit painful, but we, I, I mean, I feel the pain. I, I, I want to help these people all we can. It's, uh, and, 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 I'm, and as far as coal burning plants go, I'd love to see them all shut down. I mean, I'm really livid mad at Bruce Rahner, who has been 
lessening the, re the uh, uh, restrictions on these coal burning pan plants. It's just wrong. They, a tremendous amount of pollution that's felt as far away as New York State. So I, 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 I'm all with you. How, how is power produced if not by coal or nuclear? Oh, solar, wind, <laughs> hydro. Solar, wind, hydro. Hydro. What percent now is solar, wind, hydro? Germany's got much less done than we do, and they're already about 50% solar. And it's yeah. about three times as expensive, too. Oh, right. that's that's bullshit. I don't know why you're talking about that. We'll talk about that later. Thorium. You idiot. You. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I have to see the hurt anything about the uh, legalization of marijuana. Glad you asked, sir. He asked about the legalization of marijuana. Yeah. I am 100% in favor of that. I, I would say after 50 years, there's no need for further study. Uh, we, we know that it, uh, uh, it doesn't lead to uh, higher, you know, other drug use. Uh, I, although it's interesting, there are some studies showing that people that uh, smoke pot do tend to use other drugs more than pot, than, than non-pot smokers do. But the reason for that, you got to look further, is that they have to go into uh, an alley and buy it from uh, uh, somebody who's sitting there with an overcoat selling uh, uh, acid and, and all these other candies, you know, with the pot. And I, I'm all for it. Not only does it uh, uh, provide the obvious tax benefit, but it has two huge cost savings. One, we waste so much police time that could be better used policing real crime, that'll free them up for that. And uh, se second of all, uh, uh, incarceration. I, I mean, it's, it's, and I go, you know, right now we've got a lot of people, and I think it's going to happen soon, legalizing marijuana, but I want to go further than them, in that I would like to commute sentences for all nonviolent drug offenders. They shouldn't be there. So, yes, sir, I agree with a lot of what you had to say. I mean, it goes back to Reagan. It goes back to Bill Clinton. They both sort of sold out people of color to carry the South. And it worked. And as a result, uh, I mean, one of my favorite uh, books is uh, The New Jim Crow, if you've ever read that one, uh, uh, about, how, about how the war on drugs, the three strikes you're out, was really just a continuation of a way to continue Jim Crow. So uh, I, I'm completely for that. What about the potheads? <laughs> <laughs> what about them? Legalize it. You won't have any problem with them. What about the potheads? I've been holding my hand up from the very beginning. And he's interrupting. Can I do you? Would you right, relieve no. uh, an 85 year old crippled veteran of the necessity of holding up his arm, which is painful? I would. Oh, right thank now. you. Thank you. And that's how to make a political appeal, incidentally. <laughs> and can everyone hear me? Yeah. Uh, All right, I'll take the. Yes. Someone says they can't hear me, I'll take the microphone. To ask, I'm just going to ask a question. And I want to ask you. I want to ask you how. You're running in the Democratic primary? That's right. Okay. I want to ask you how you will respond when you're. Uh, the incumbent, I guess, you're running against, right. a woman, when she says, um, Mr. Goldberg, is that your name? Yes. Mr. Goldberg's intentions are wonderful. He wants to pay, uh, have, uh, pay the, uh, the pension fund at a greater rate than, um, than we've been paying it. That would be wonderful if we could do that. But I'd like to point out to him that because we've been delaying the, she might not put it quite this blatantly, because we've been delaying the payments to the pension funds, we can afford more money for education. And we might even be able to get the free um, uh, junior colleges that you say we can't afford. In other words, she would be catching you with saying it's more important to pay off the debt than uh, to fund the uh, pension fund than it is to educate our children. Now, I'm not proposing, I'm not saying she's right, I'm not saying you're right, I'm just saying I guarantee you'll be, you won't get 12% of the vote. 
what? So what is your what would be your response to her? Yeah. Then I've wasted four months of my time. That that that's distressing. Oh, well, but well, here's the here's the thing. I, I mean, still, yeah. you're right. She's she's gonna go after me full barrel. But you've I mean, opened the way to her. Well, I have to I I, I have to advocate what I believe. And and the point is, if we care about these kids, we don't want to just educate them today. We want to be able to educate them in 10 years. And we're what not about the kids today? What about the kids today? Uh, well, we have, <laughs> we have to do the best we can right now. Well, maybe yeah, the best we can would be to delay paying the pe pension yeah. fund and educating them now because they're going to grow up in 10 years to, yeah, to, be, to, be, to be criminals if they can't get jobs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, so I maybe totally a crisis. All right, let me ask a question back there. Yeah. Go ahead. Back, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm the the states that are going to decriminalize that they're going to go after them. To where you really have to go to the Congress and get them to repeal their marijuana laws. Well, you bet. I mean, uh, I, I can't do that, right? But certainly we would want the U.S. Congress to do that. I guess, uh, uh, I mean, there's already been so many states that have legalized marijuana, and Jeff Sessions hasn't done anything yet. But it is a concern. No doubt it's a concern. You can't do one who without the Congress. Well, sir, they already have. I mean, you go to Colorado right now, you can buy it. Now, and I don't know how many states there are now. There's, a, I think there's close to 10? Nine or 10. It's still illegal under federal law. Good. It's still illegal under federal law, but it's happening every day. Go ahead, Charlie. Uh, two part question. Are you in favor of free senior public transit fare? Seniors not having to pay public transit. And number two, at 8.15, the 1.52 bus outside cuts off running. Do you have any recommendations for transit from this district? Uh, uh, Charles, uh, you seem to know a lot more about it than I do. Yeah, so I, I know you'll figure it out. <laughs> the California bus doesn't come by either. Right. Yeah, California's running. But it's going south. Yeah, oh, well, that's a question over here. What do you uh, think about uh, the illegal uh, alien amnesty for illegal aliens and sanctuary state? Are you for or against that? that, that? Oh, it's funny you ask that because uh, uh, I, I'm happy to say I got, and I think Charles broadcasted in the ad, I got a really glowing review from endorsement from the Tribune this week. But I was broken hearted when I didn't get to Sun Times. I, I, I was there and it was the first time I had met my opponent, Iris Martinez, and I, I left there 98% sure I was going to get that endorsement because it was just really stunning that some of these people in the legislature just aren't policy people. There were so many things that I was talking about that she was simply unaware of. But she got the endorsement, and she got the endorsement, and in the endorsement it said that while I schooled her on uh, the pension and uh, uh, rent control and all these other issues, they were concerned that I didn't know enough about immigration. What? You know, I think we could trust that somebody who's a public policy nerd can learn about immigration, but what I told them when they brought up immigration, because really immigration is not primarily a state issue to begin with. I mean, that's, that's why we have federal law. But I told them unequivocally that I favor the sanctuary city status in Chicago. I favor the Trust Act that Governor Rahner passed in, in Illinois. And I'm disgusted with Trump's treatment right now of some of the uh, refugees. The one that really bothers me is, not that this has anything to do with Illinois, but I'm just talking, El Salvador. They, they had a disaster 17 years ago. And, and the deal was, yeah, you could come here while the country's being rebuilt. Well, if we were going to ask them to return, that should have been done about 12 or 13 years ago, right? There's a concept in law called estoppel, 
you know, once you've waited too long, it's too long. It's so wrong to make people leave once they've raised families. And so I was really troubled by it, and I told him that. And even though my opponent said nothing about immigration, she got the uh, endorsement, and I didn't on, on that basis. And it was, I still cry at night. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, the Illinois Senate and the Illinois House, I think they passed something about uh, B, uh, BDS in Israel, boycott, divest, sanction, and Rauner didn't sign it. I, I, what would have been your vote? Boycott and divest for sanction. Yes. So the idea was to boycott Israel? No, it's not a boycott of Israel. It's a boycott of the products produced it's you know, an economic by, by, by the Israeli companies in the West Bank. Right. It's an economic boycott. You didn't hear You don't know about it? No, I don't. Like, you don't know immigration, I guess. I am. Um, <laughs> you need a better candidate. Boycott. <laughs> Irish doesn't know about it either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it, it kind of, were they suggesting that the Illinois government itself boycott? Well, some states, like I think Kansas passed one, but then they, they brought it to court to, because it was unconstitutional. Because they might make it unconstitutional. Yeah, I can but, tell you that I've got little patience for symbolic acts. We've got to deal with the real problems. No, it's a, it's, it's a real thing. It's okay. not symbolic. Yes. Okay. It's real. Yeah. You know, um, uh, Daniel Viss, who's running for governor, was ha had a lieutenant. Uh, that's right. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it, it was Rosa. It, 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 it was, was Rosa. Carlos Rosa. That's and, right. And, uh, Carlos Rosa. And he was in favor of BDS. But Viss comes from the North Shore. And it's not that he's Jewish, you know, but he comes from the North Shore. And as... Jan Schakowsky, they depend on that vote. And so this dumped Rosas and picked up another lieutenant governor, whom I met last night, by the way. And um, uh, it was really, it, it really uh, put a kink in his, uh, in, in his campaign for a short t time. Yeah, I remember that very well. And it's and, because, and, it and, and if it and I respect the heck out of Dan Biss. Yeah. yeah, okay. So if Dan Biss wasn't in favor of it, I tend to think I wouldn't be in favor of it either. I mean, he's he's a pretty smart, thoughtful guy. Dan Biss is, and, yeah. and in fact, you know, when people ask me, you know, what what do I want to be as a legislator? He's really a model. Uh, there's there's another local senator who. Uh, on Biss's endorsement page talks about the great thing about Dan Biss is he was always the most informed member of the Senate. When, when he made an argument, he knew what he was talking about. He had the facts behind him. And that's what I intend to be because we've just got way too many people there in the Senate that, in my estimation, really aren't policy people. They're, they're, they're there for other reasons and uh, they just vote the the party line when, when confronted with it. Read question. You, you said the boycott of the Israeli products from the West Bank was a waste of time or something like that, right? What did you say about it? Well, I didn't say that because I don't know exactly what it is. But I what I'm you said boycotts like that are not useless. It's symbolic. No, it's it's symbolic. symbolic. Right. Oh, I said okay. if it's merely symbolic, yeah. Okay. And, and we often see that in legislatures. They pass things. That, that are really just to make a so statement. The question is, do you support the boycott against South Africa when it was a fascist, racist, apartheid state? Of course. Thank you. Okay. Trade Can I ask another question? Um, it's fine with me. Yeah. Next to Charlie. Oh. Yeah, I have a question. <clears throat> The first part of the question is, I taught for almost high school for almost three years, and they uh, <coughs> subtracted uh, from uh, my pension money. About 35 years later, they returned it to me without one penny of interest. Do you have that interest, you know? No, I have no idea. They, they gave you your money back yeah. without any interest. Right. After 35 years of um, 
the second thing is, um, you, you know, you're talking about in order to pay the debt, you're looking at uh, the big company and increasing the trip taxes by 3% or something. How about the, the one that is a sitting down is actually the property owner. Oh, you're right. And, and see, if, if, if we don't meet this, prop, this problem head on, I mean, I don't know how we're going to finance it, but the obvious, the obvious target is property taxes. I mean, property taxes, and I'm making this number up, it's not based on any math. It wouldn't surprise me that if, if, if we haven't taken other steps, property taxes could be several times more than they are right now. It already because, are in McHenry County. Because, you know, how, as this gentleman pointed out, you've got to educate children every year. And if, and if the budget doesn't allow it, you know, that's where it's going to come from, is property taxes. My last, Sorry. just one little short question. This pension contract that the, the uh, government has with the uh, teachers mm -hmm. and, and water workers and so forth, um, <coughs> is that a legal lot or just a political contract compared to the contract we have with a parking, which is legally we can change it? No, it, it, it's just as legally binding. Uh, I mean, there's paperwork. It's it's uh, it's a law, and uh, they're entitled to those benefits. And our Constitution says they can never be decreased, though they can be increased. Oh. Who hasn't had a question yet tonight? This guy okay. here, over, over there. Yeah. Uh, what about the quality of the way uh, pension monies are invested? Quality of what? The way pension monies are invested. Wow, that's a good one. Uh, <coughs> no, I don't know. You know, if if it can be done better, I mean, I I, I have a sense that given in this state that uh, is so rife with cronyism that uh, you know maybe we're selecting uh, our companies to invest our money that uh, uh, aren't getting the best return. But I'll tell you something related to that that scared the heck out of me. Uh, this is something that got proposed by Democrats recently, and uh, I think it was actually started by one of our five state unions. They suggested that we issue bonds to pay down the state debt essentially in full. Issue the, the biggest bond issue in the history of the state by far. And the idea being that we would then take that money, put it in the market, and earn more than what we're paying in interest. I mean, there's some people, they got to quit drinking and, and quit going back to the casino. This is, this is crazy. We're in near junk bond status right now. We would have to pay such a high interest rate. And then, if we take all of our money, that we're paying this high interest rate on, put it in the market, and the market goes down 15%, there, there's no way we're ever coming back. I mean, it, it, it is just the most foolish suggestion that I've ever seen. I think we have to invest pretty conservatively, sir. We just can't risk it. Okay. We'll have one more question, then go to rebuttals. Uh, Charlie. Yeah, Bart, implicit many campaign finance reform proposals are the are, is the government paying government paying for campaigns i mean we got we got some nazi running on the third district on the south side and we got to finance this campaign and the other one is it generally results in increased government control over campaigns uh, how do you plan on dealing with those? Well, I mean, you want you know, to obviously that... Your, your next campaign? Well, I mean, you're aware nobody's receiving any government assistance in their campaigns now, right? Okay. Right, so that Nazi is not getting any money. You're saying if the legislature were to pass campaign reform, because there's a lot of suggestions out there, again, as I said earlier, none of them are going to pass. Nobody in Springfield wants campaign finance reform. But one you often hear of is this, 
that if people would agree to uh, uh, cap how much they would take, uh, you know, maybe the one that I've self-imposed, a thousand dollars, they would allow a, a matching program. And, and often, let's go what I hear now. Thank all our right, speaker. Give our speaker a big hand. Yes, sir. I thank all of you. So uh, let's have a uh, show of hands of who wants to give a rebuttal. One, two, three, four. You guys move up to the on deck circle there, please, just like in baseball. You know where it is on the other side of the rail. You know, I, I have trouble standing. You want to sit down here? All right. Uh, who, who else uh, is going to give a rebuttal? I will. Tim? Okay. Yet. Yeah. And Charlie. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll go with our usual four minutes then. Okay. I'll, I'll time. We got time. Make it time. We'll we'll go four minutes. Okay. So I'm Margaret Aguilar, and I'm not in both sense of the words attendee at um, the college. And uh, my rebuttal is actually two weeks late. So the first thing I would like to do is, or maybe three, I don't know. But I'd like to thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate your opinions, and you do sound like a nerd, but you do sound <laughs> well informed. So if we we don't live in the 20th district, and if we did, I would be tempted to vote for you to say the least. So the, my, my late uh, rebuttal is, in fact, to some statements that this gentleman made three weeks or two weeks ago to the uh, young woman who was from Iran, or Turkey, no, she's from Turkey, and she came here less than five years ago, and he told her that she should go back. So my family came here, uh, my father's family came here in 1620, and my mother's family came here in 1799. So if you came after 1800, you have to go back. I didn't say, I said she you did. have to go back because you family came here she wants to overthrow and the your family were robbers and rapists and criminals just like those Mexicans yeah. she knows me so what? Well. but what really happened when you I'm sorry when you have well it's crazy I'm just I know I, he, he can hear me without the mic but what really happens with immigrant families is that they don't come here to be criminals or robbers or rapists. In fact, if the, studies, if the studies are showing that the crime rate in immigrant communities is way lower than it is with Americans. But what really happens is that immigrants come here and they make businesses and they build houses and they have families and they send their kids to school and the second generation is professionals who uh, take care of us in the hospitals and who are uh, lawyers and, and who screw us generally. But anyway, um, but that they're not generally criminals and rapists and robbers and et cetera. So um, at any rate, so I really find it pretty foul that you told her that she had to go back. And I think it's because she was Muslim, too. So, you know, it was racist. It was a bigoted uh, comment. And that is she said she was fault. here five years. She wants to overthrow the government. Uh, That's what I said. <laughs> Get it right. You're dead wrong, too, yeah. with your views. Yeah, all right. All right, Mo. She said five years. She wants to overthrow yeah. the government. And the other people, too. That's not what she said. Yeah, got records. I'll just deal with I'll just deal with one problem that Charlie raised and that Mr. Goldberg didn't have an answer. Usually, I think Mr. Goldberg is very well informed. I would advise you next time when you make a political speech, don't start with um, uh, uh, account, 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 accountancy like money here, money there. It's a little. People need to know a benefit right away. Anyhow, and I'll tell you a benefit that we can get and to solve Charlie's problem so he doesn't have to buy a, a car. Do you have a car, Charlie? No. Yeah. I don't want Charlie to buy, buy a car. So, the CTA just raised its $2 fare to two twenty five, which may not seem like a big raise to some of you, but um, 
to uh, poor people can be, but it also has a negative effect on business in Chicago. I have a plan for cutting uh, CTA beers in half and getting more money for C C the CTA. I don't know, maybe I can only cut it 10%. I don't know. I'm, I'm not as good an accountant as Mr. Goldberg is. It's real simple. All we have to do in the city of Chicago is guess what? Anyone, how CTA can make hundreds of millions more without increasing the fare, and maybe it'll enable them to. There's a business for them to go into that is right in front of everyone's noses, but we've accepted it as a private business. There's a lot of privatization going on. We need a little bit more socialization. It will be very easy. By one, there are several different means by which the, um, the, the city can take over <coughs> Uber. Uber is sending $100 million out of the city. Don't shout in the mic. Oh, don't shout in the mic. Okay, I want to shout so I'll get away from the mic. Um, it's a net loss to the, uh, the city economy. If I were in the uh, city council, don't even, you can run for the city council, you don't even have to run for the state legislature. If I were in the city council, I would introduce, at the very least, a bill to, oh, let us say, quadruple the taxes on the 60 or $100 million that the poor Uber drivers have to send to National Uber Corporate Headquarters because of the great service of uh, letting them know who their customers are. Uh, the next step would be to say that the city drivers, we want the city drivers to have more money to stimulate the economy, and the way we're going to do that is require that any such service be a cooperative, and they can establish their own uh, call-in number for those who want to get a, a ride, and um, they could probably run them more efficiently than this national corporation, but in any case, all of the profits from that will stay in Chicago, will stay in the pockets of the Uber drivers. They might even be able to lower, um, oh, but I've got, I lost, forgot the CTA. If the CTA owns this, then the CTA will get millions and the, you don't have to reduce, you don't have to reduce the, uh, uh, the fares that the drivers are getting. The CTA will get that, I don't know, I think it's 60 or 100 million dollars a year that is going to the national corporate Uber headquarters and we don't need them. So that's one way of going, you know, we're so used to the word Uber, oh yeah, Uber is a private company and there's nothing even much you can do about it. We gotta think more. Thank you. Uh, I sneak in the other question I wanted to ask the speaker tonight. Uh, the, the man who's running for governor, uh, Chris Kennedy, uh, obviously is familiar with Massachusetts. And Massachusetts has a flat tax, the same as Illinois. But he said Massachusetts has gotten around this and he knows what Massachusetts did to get around the flat tax so that they really are taxing um, uh, people with a lot of money more than they're taxing the poor. I don't know how they do it, but he is sure that it would also work in Illinois. And I think maybe a conversation with Chris Kennedy about how Massachusetts handled this would be useful to you. We're going to concentrate tonight. I like our, our Senate candidate. I think he's well informed about a lot of the issues. But I am hesitant to bring this up because we, it's a very contentious issue here at the college. But I'm going to. We do have a plan to get rid, to go 
independent on our energy future. And if the Senate, if the Senate candidate would take a look at something called the Thorium Energy Alliance oh, what out of Harvard, Illinois. Well, you know, you Frank, don't know what the fuck you're talking about, and you see, Frank, you really don't, don't know, know what the, the fuck you're talking about, and you keep several, insisting in bringing right. that right. fucking right. shit again. Then give a rebuttal to me after rebuttal. I'm done. You don't deserve a rebuttal. You deserve a kick in the ass. No. Well, you see, the thing is, is that this. Uh, gentleman by the name of John Kutch and a number of other people have outlined a program that will bring us forward and take care of the nuclear waste, take care of the uh, power that goes into it, and it's called the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. I know you know about them and you're still against them, but you've also made an informed choice against them after looking at the evidence. A lot of people here I made the informed choice by accepting it because I do know that the more I talk to some of these nuclear scientists, people in the world, around this topic, that it's a viable future. I don't think wind and solar are going to do it because of their intermittency. The amount what? Of, because of their lack of inter, in, intermittency. The sun don't always shine. You what know. are they doing in Germany? They got less sun than we do. do you and know incidentally, the German economy is doing much better than the time American time. economy. And I'm from what my understanding is, <laughs> Germany right now pays about three times more than in energy, and they're burning more coal. But they got they jobs. Hey, don't shout. You'll be asked to leave if you can't. Oh, be they're still buying leaving. a lot of their electric power from France, which is nuclear. And the thing is, what you have to understand is that the type of reactor I'm talking about. Is a whole different ball game than the fusion than the fission reactors we have today. But they're, they're a lot more modular. About ten times as much as we are in solar. That wasn't a shout. Well, the thing is, you look at. Okay. I'm just going to simply say this: for those of you who are really interested in finding some alternatives <laughs> and, and a real future for our power grid. I'm going to ask you to uh, take a look at the Thorium Energy Alliance homepage out of, out of Harvard, Illinois with John Kutch. Take a look at some of the videos given by um, Gordon McDowell. Take a look at Elvin Weinberg, the guy who helped invent the light water reactor but was actually fired in 1973 by Chet Holyfield because of his views on, on the light water reactor and how he came up with the alternative through the thorium molten salt reactor. And the thing was, we did this already in the 1960s for over 6,000 hours. And if you take a look at the evidence, I think you'll find that it's there. You can't compare a reactor that we have now with what they're proposing. And they are, there's about four companies right now that are ready to bring these online within the next two years. Thorcon, Flybe Energy, and a couple of others. And believe me, there are investments in Wall Street finally starting to come down the pipeline, and we're going to be seeing these. Plus, China has now 600 people working on this very project to oh. help. Oh, yes. Oh. Yes, Charlie. They're probably going to do it. Our Department of Energy is helping them out. Anyway, I will not. I brought up enough controversy tonight. I've asked everybody that they take a look at it, and I'll be more than happy to argue any of you on this. Thank you for your Why won't the insurance companies insure the nuclear power reactor? I wouldn't insure a light water reactor either. It's too any dangerous. Reactor. Any reactor. I would have won't so goddamn The actuaries are our first line of defense against disaster, and the actuaries are, don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. They're I saying, agree with you on the light the water reactor, of, Mo. The chances of a nuclear disaster from any power plant are so great they don't even want to give an insurance policy. Then how come that the nuclear industry is probably one of the most safest in the world right now? Take a look at the results of the, if you take a good look at the results of Fukushima, of okay. Chernobyl. You should be scared shitless. Well, if it's so wonderful, <laughs> why don't they insure it? <laughs> and you, my friends, are the victim of a lot of propaganda. There wasn't a lot of propaganda. It's a disaster. It's it's still leaking. Radioactive water. water. Let's you're leave it. Let's leave it at this. We brought enough controversy up today to get going. You're proving that you're not a whale. 
<laughs> yes, I'm not a whale. Right. Oh. Stubborn, obstinate, yes. <laughs> Give Tim a hand. Okay. Nice. Yeah, boy, Tim. Get him out of here. Here's a, here's a, oh, here's a, 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 I feel, I feel compelled to not talk about what I was going to talk about, but to at least respond to Tim. Uh, right now, uh, uh, Fukushima uh, was not a disaster in the past tense. Yeah, that's true. It, it, it's still happening. The, the All the radioactive material melted down to the groundwater. It's too dangerous for them to recover it. It's still down there. It's it's uh, it's uh, contaminating the groundwater. The groundwater is moving into the ocean. The ocean currents are spreading the radioactivity through through the Pacific Ocean. The scientists are tracking it, uh, and they're tracking it by the fish because there are people fishing, and then the fish are getting eaten by people. So it's still an ongoing. Their solution is to dig piles all around the site, fill it with water, and freeze it. Okay? So the simple solution for Fukushima is to create the largest freezer in the world and then to pay the cost of operating it for a thousand years. So it's a very simple solution, right? So now, in respect to Tim, he's talking about thorium reactors, which are different than regular reactors. So I'm not attacking thorium, right? But the regular, but Fukushima is the poster child for the success of the nuclear industry. So that being said, the reason I'm up here is because the 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 ugly truth facing Illinois residents is that right now we are hundreds of billions of dollars in debt. The, uh, the gerrymandering by the Democratic Party is controlling power. They know that if they start paying the bills like they should have been doing all the time, and this includes Republican uh, governors beforehand who could have talked about this, um, but Democrats have been controlling the Senate for a long time, so uh, the legislature, uh, if they start paying that, and all of us start paying the real costs that we should be paying, our tax is going to be so outrageous, you know what's going to happen. People are going to vote, and they're going to put Republicans in power. And that's what Madigan and the Republicans don't want. They're not, they, they know that if they bill us the true amount, the Republicans take over the following year. And that's why they're not going to do anything. They're not. Now, for some reason, we get, to, like, they're treating Detroit, and they take over the, and the banks take over, and we really start paying, start shopping for a new state. And I, I hate being a pessimist. I haven't heard anybody suggest a reasonable way to get out of this. If you have a comment, that's fine, but I'm still waiting to hear something positive. So. Start shopping for your state. How much of that radiation yes. from Japan has been getting to the West Coast? I haven't read that. All right. Oh, no, they're lefties. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Dave. They're all lefties. I'm not Michael Madigan's biggest fan on the one hand. No. But on the other hand, I've heard a few too many comments about how the Democrats gerrymandered the legislature. No one complained when the Republicans did that. They only started complaining when the Democrats did. I guess it all depends on whose ox is gored. Uh, that's number one. I'm not a Republican. That's number one. Number two, I've also, I'm not speaking here so much about what you said about labor unions. You raised a legitimate question. But there's a commercial that's been running around on TV that, um, that uh, Rauner has been uh, uh, putting on about his, his primary opponent, Jeannie Ives, yeah. in which she's been saying about how shady labor union cash is helping her. Yeah. Shady labor union cash? Why is it nobody talks about shady uh, Chamber of Commerce cash or shady cash from the Illinois Association of Manufacturers? It's only labor unions that are shady. Well, I'm a retired Teamster. My mother was at an active and enthusiastic member of the Chicago Teachers Union 
and our household labor union stood in pretty good. They helped my mother bring in the salary and benefits she needed to help her family. So um, I'll start. I'll stop complaining about uh, shady chamber of commerce cash when they start stop complaining about shady labor union cash. Thank you. Who's next? All right. All right, Charlie. Let's see. I got a number of things here. But let's begin by thanking our, our candidate and speaker. Hey, Doug Brevard. The name on relatively short notice, but appreciate your taking time out from the Sidious campaign. Congratulations on your endorsement. And Tim, let's get the video up because he wants to I, 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 use I, I that will. for you know we can't. We got to show that we're responsible here at the college. I'm, I'm a weak. I'm a weak. Not like lefties, you know. I'm behind. They do things when they feel like it, you know. No, we'll get them up, Charlie. <laughs> Are you going to be eclectic, Charlie? <laughs> yes, I'll be eclectic as usual. Uh, we didn't have time to get into it, but uh, the Greens are coming next week. Um, and uh, certainly the Illinois environmental policy is something of concern, to me at least, and a subject of great importance now, given the diminished role of the federal government towards assuming its responsibilities uh, regarding environmental issues under the Trump administration. So the state hopefully will take that up. I know there's a number of things that standards outstanding um, that the state can get involved with. Um, frick it, fracking, there's no fracking wells, from my understanding, yeah. within the state. So that issue technically still is alive. And no license has been issued uh, in the state, so technically that's still going. Regarding uh, transit, uh, Mo kind of hit on it, what he's talking about somewhat. is called, uh, this the different things about this Uber and Lyft. Uh, in public transit, there's always concerns what is called the first mile and the last mile. Um, and like I was asking my question to you, is my first mile is how do I get to the L from here? That was kind of my thing. I may have some issues here regarding that. And a lot of people take advantage of Lyft to do that thing. Now from my understanding, the feds are cutting back significantly. Trump. Trump's infrastructure plan, I like this, is not only zero funding for public transit infrastructure, it's a cut. It is actually, in, he targeted public transit for something like, a, he made, not only was it zero, he actually eliminated existing programs. So it is an issue here. From what my understanding is, the city was levying a taxation on these uh, taxi type services um, the, to uh, finance, to make up. Now the other thing is the state of Illinois under Rauner cut back on their funding for public transit. So there was like, uh, a perfect storm. Um, the amazing thing is the city of Chicago contributes nothing for public transit, it never has. And so it is significant for the first time that they are uh, funding public transportation. They never, it was entirely the state or the feds and the fare box uh, that, that were doing it. So that's a new transition here. Uh, the thing between cars and buses and trains is called integrated transit, if you want the term of art for this. Uh, regarding uh, Chernobyl, I have photographs I often send to Tim. <laughs> it's, it's the public transit. The rail lines that were state-of-the-art rail lines that were running to and from Chernobyl, they had just put in beautiful trains. Now. The after of it, there live, there's trees growing in the middle of the tracks. That line is completely out of service because that city is uninhabitable. 
Uh, regarding the water, we're going to have the people here talk about water. You can talk about Chernobyl water. I think um, every hour, how many millions of gallons does it make contaminate with radiation? Uh, and it's going to continue doing that. They sent some robots in there to fix it, and I believe they both melted twice. So it is a problem. No, oh, Fukushima. Chernobyl is uh, Chernobyl is just covered with concrete. That's going to explode any time. But Fukushima is churning out the radioactive water for the benefit of the world. She's right, <laughs> and defeating Andy. Now, I love this thing about the um, your your pals there. Um, they don't believe there's such a thing as radiation. Oh yes, they. So do. there's a bit of a problem when you try to argue with them, because they don't think radiation is like harmful. It's just like nothing. It's just like sunlight or something. It's not a, nothing to be concerned about. I'm absolutely serious about this. So there's some disconnect if you try to engage them on this topic. So, anyhow, thanks a lot for good luck on the campaign and we'll see you in Springfield. All right. Thanks Andy too. Well, can I have a show of hands? Let, let's see, we, we have a lot of disagreement on things. Uh, let's see if we, if we can all agree uh, what kind of agreement we have and what kind of disagreement. Let me have a show of hands. Who thinks that the pedophile priests were doing a good job with our kids? <laughs> so we, we, we're all in agreement that that was a bad thing that happened to the kids, right? Yes. There's, 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 no pro-pedophiles here today. Okay. Who thinks that those 155 young women gymnasts are lying about the sexual abuse of that trainer for 20 years? Anybody think those women are lying? No. No. That's because they're telling the truth. It's like forensic evidence. There's evidence and then there's opinion. There's a sexist point you could make. Uh, now it's moves agree. forward. And now, be, now yeah, it moves forward in the direction of truth. You can be all in support of Father O'Malley if you don't know he's abusing the kids. After you learn that, if you're like the 99% of us that have some shred of ethics, morals, and a conscience, maybe not the best, but just a shred, you have to join the camp that said this is wrong. We have to do something about it. And personally. I was avidly pro-nuclear back at, at one time in my life. When I was a young man, uh, I outfitted my house. It was going to be all electric. Uh, we were going to get cheap electricity from uh, the nuclear power plants of Conhead. I was very, very pro-nuclear in 1979 until I stumbled across my first book by John Glockman called Poison Power. And then uh, a slew of books after that, I read about a hundred others talking about the essence of why nuclear power is a health hazard and a disaster worldwide. And I was where Tim is now. And I, uh, I hope that he will move forward like I did. <laughs> and once you face it, it, it's like the article said today in, uh, on Common Dreams, they're finally saying, do Trump supporters, adults with college educations, really deserve our respect because they're maintaining themselves in a bubble of criminal ignorance. Well, that's what this is. When you're talking about things, you support something that's a disaster after the answer is known, that's criminal ignorance. And uh, Fukushima, there's been a lot of propaganda that Tim has read, apparently, sh saying that Fukushima is not a global disaster of biblical proportions. The infant mortality rate went up on the west coast as the clouds drifted out of Fukushima and hit our west coast. All the way up the west coast, they recorded, uh, I don't know, many hundreds, of, a couple thousand babies died over statistical. And they know and they can track the pollution. Fukushima is an ongoing disaster that um, is poisoning the oceans. So when you talk about a new generation of uh, nuclear power plants, you have this whole legacy, why nobody in their right mind is going to risk a dime insuring those things. Number two, 
promoting a new generation of nuclear power plants is like working on a, a, a blood clotting agent to, to, to clot to seal up knife wounds and stuff, and somebody comes into the emergency room that's got a, a deep gash and it needs to be sewed up, say, oh, no, no, I've, I've got a new blood clotting agent. It will be ready in two years. Well, that person's going to bleed to death in a matter of minutes if you don't do something now. We don't have 10 years to fire around with the next generation to get a couple of nukes online. We got five years between 2017 and 2022. There's five years to address and solve the global warming issue. Go look at the stock offerings of Thorcon. What? Go look at the stock offerings of Flyb Energy and Thorcon. Tim is talking about stock offerings. I have one thing to say about that. The stock market is a giant casino where smooth operators take money from other investors that don't know what the facts are. P.T. Barnum, I think, is the one that said there's a sucker born every minute. We elected him and as president. What do you expect? We didn't. Uh, here's another myth. You know, for those of you that don't know, Trump was not elected. They redshifted the computers in three states after we went to bed. Three blue states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, voted overwhelmingly. Uh, not for that, but as one person said, the, the, the choice we were given in the election last year was one, one lady said it was a choice between gonorrhea and syphilis. <laughs> I said before that it was a choice between two serial killers. This one kills one woman a month, this one kills four women a month, so pick the lesser of the two serial killers. That's how I looked at it last year. And so, there, uh, for those of you that might want to come and see an alternative presentation, there's um, a man from the Zeitgeist movement coming about an alternative worldview that is a resource-based economy where you don't have predators and their politician prostitutes running the government. We got predators and prostitutes today in Washington. The billionaire predators and their whole stable of intellectual prostitutes that were on huge display this week as they were asked point blank, are you going to stop taking money from the NRA to keep voting to give uh, 50 bullet, you know, uh, these 30, 40, 50 uh, bullet machine guns to anybody that wants one? When, other, is, when is that presentation? It's on the schedule. Uh, about three or four weeks. Here. It's going to be here. Oh, okay. It's a, it's a, it's a written up. It's a zeitgeist book. And, and for those of you that want an update presentation, on uh, forensic evidence on several subjects, huge databases that aren't covered by the press. I'll be giving that presentation on April 7th. Okay. So uh, there's not a lot of write-up in there other than it says censored news because I'm still working on, a, it'll be a lot of current stuff of what's happening in the country and what we have to do okay. to solve problems. We're gonna have a lot of solutions that night, so uh, you know, come with your questions and uh, I think you'll be uh, interested. So uh, our speaker gets the last word. So come on up and uh, give us uh, your, your take. You've got uh, probably 10, 12 minutes. Oh, I won't take that long. Thank you, everyone. Because uh, I need to get home and get to sleep. It's late for me. Uh, just a couple of things. One, you mentioned Chris Kennedy. And there's a lot I like about Chris Kennedy. But I have not seen any real plans from Chris in terms of uh, finances. And I know that once when I saw him speak, uh, someone got up and said, uh, you know, I've got a pension. How do I know that uh, the state's going to be able to pay that someday? And his response was so tone deaf in my ear. He said, oh, well, don't worry about it. You know. Uh, his response was essentially, Illinois has infinite money, don't worry about it. It's just so wrong. I mean, people, I don't know if when politicians say things like that, and he's not the only one, if they just don't know better, or if, if it's just the way you sell fiction to voters so that you can get elected. I, I, I don't know, but, but I am troubled by that I, I haven't seen yet any real uh, plans from Chris Kennedy about how he's going to uh, uh, finance things. Uh, as to this gentleman right here in the gray right in front of me, uh, I agree with him that uh, uh, you know labor unions have every much as right uh, every, uh, a need and, and that's what their job is, is to, to get the best deal that they can for, for uh, their workers. And uh, um, 
I, although I would say that there are a few labor unions that I, I don't like the way that they play too hard. Uh, the SEIU comes to mind that, uh, that they are really quick to go very negative and in my view disingenuously so and, and that's just part of what I hate what about was, what politics. What was one bad thing they did? Oh gosh, some of the... What? Uh, one one uh, campaign that I watched rather intently was the, my local aldermanic campaign uh, and it had to do with uh, 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 Arena versus Garrido and uh, this, this guy Garrido he made a mistake for five minutes he had on his Facebook advertised that they were going to uh, have a that, that these cards were being offered by businesses and that if you could show that you voted that day and of course they don't know who you voted for you'd get a 10 percent discount at those participating stores the idea was to uh, uh, you know promote these stores and, and to promote people voting you can't do that you're, you're not allowed to give benefits is that the worst thing the seie seiu oh, i haven't finished oh, wait, go ahead. okay i'm not saying it's the worst thing but well, they spent. Know, so they, I'm not very impressed with that as an evil. I haven't, I haven't told you the evil. <laughs> the evil was that the entire election became pictures of this candidate behind bars. That he was a criminal. That he violated the law. They didn't talk about what. But you know, are you going to elect this criminal when you can be electing this other person that's not? It's just, I, I hate that discourse. I hate it with a passion. We have to be talking about issues, and people don't do it, and, and I'm just saying they fall in that camp. That's all there is to it. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not people that are non-union also doing it. I'm just saying that I've seen it in particular. They play hard, and to their, and they would say, great, we should play hard. You know, the stakes are high. But yeah. personally, I, I, I don't care for it. Right. I'm, I'm a play hard guy. Right, right. And I'm, a, I'm sort of a play-by-the-facts no. guy. <laughs> you know, you want, you want a sissy union? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and as to what you were saying, I mean, I couldn't agree more with uh, uh, most of what you were saying. You, you're just absolutely right about uh, uh, the <clears throat> politicians, by and large, are not upfront with us about how bad the situation is because there's just no, there's no benefit to it to, to, to them. I mean. The whole game is uh, raise money, get the club reelected, but hopefully you're being a little bit cynical. I, I do think that there, if, if we can really hold people's feet to the fire, if we can take people to Springfield, that will really cut through the nonsense. We there is still time to save Illinois, but but you're right, people are leaving, and it is a problem. So lastly. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that anybody lives in the 20th district, but even if you don't, what, what you know, it? it's over it? here. Yeah, yeah let me tell you quickly. That's uh, the shape of it, but where is it? Yeah, it starts southeast corner is Logan Square, oh. and then as you go west, you're in Belmont Cragen, Hermosa. As you come up a little north, you're in Portage Park. What's the northern boundary? Yeah, and then as you go a little further east, you'll get to Independence Park, Avondale, Old Irving Park, the Villa, and then the northern boundary is Albany Park. So it extends from about Belmont to just west of Austin, goes as far south as just south of Armitage and north of Lawrence. So if you, any of you know people in that district, please contact them for me. I, I would really appreciate it. But some of you might want to get involved because the state senator does not just serve that district. Obviously, if I have even a modicum of success in the things that I want to do, it benefits all of Illinois. So please consider what I have to say. Let me know if you can volunteer, contact me, and uh, try and uh, contact people in the 20th district because uh, they are the ones that get to decide. And I would be honored if they support me. Give us your website and your Facebook page. All right. Uh, my website, my website is Bart for, you know, Bart for State Senate.com. It's on my card that I gave you. Uh, so it's not like the number four, it's F O R, Bart for State Senate.com. And my Facebook page, you've got me. 
I don't know what it is except that I know that it exists. I think uh, uh, you can get to it through my website or you can just go to Facebook and uh, 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 you know input Bart Goldberg and, and it, it will take you there. So that's really it. Thank you all so much for letting me talk. It was really fun. Out. I enjoyed it. Gavel us out. Right there or not. What, what's, what's that? I was just going to say gavel us out. Oh. Okay, thank you all for coming that's tonight. Right. Uh, we're adjourned and we will see you next week. Thank you. So what did you learn? Bring it on!